Hello and welcome again to Telecom TV and our exclusive content from Broadband World Forum 2015 here in London's Docklands at the Excel Exhibition Centre. I'm very pleased to be talking to an old friend, Mansour Hanif, who is the director of RAN, the Radio Access Network at EE. Mansour, we keep meeting all the time around the world talking about things radio uh, and EE and mobile and so on. Um, what has happened since our last meeting a few months ago as far as EE's work in the radio access network is concerned? Uh, as usual, <laughs> too many things to mention, but if <laughs> I was to take, well actually just this morning we've we released our, our highlights from our financial quarter. So good news, we've got up to 12.6 million 4G customers. So we're pretty sure that we're number one in Europe in terms of 4G subscribers. And some interesting facts and figures there as well. We've got 52% now of our whole base is on 4G. So we've tipped over to the majority of people on 4G and it's going, you know, I think we put in 1.7 million uh, uh, new customers on 4G over the last quarter. We've also got um, over 15 million customers on postpaid contracts, which are obviously you know, very key for us for customer loyalty. And we feel that's being driven you know, particularly by 4G and, uh, you know, uh, and, and the improvements that we're putting into our service. So all in all, very good. ARPU is holding up. Um, overall, a very positive quarter for us. In terms of the radio networks, we're still pushing, still struggling to roll out to the most remote areas of the country. So I think the last time we spoke, we were getting close to 85% population coverage. That's absolutely right. And now we're 93.5%. So we're very close to our target of 95% by the end of the year. And you know how difficult it is to reach the really remote areas sure. of, uh, of the country. So we're reasonably happy with that. We'd like to go even faster if we could, but uh, obviously it's quite challenging. Um, aside from that, I think since we last spoke, we've launched voice over Wi-Fi, seamless voice over Wi-Fi. Yeah, so we're second that. after yeah. uh, in the world after T-Mobile US to do it over IMS in a seamless manner for the customer. That's gone very, very well. We're also now live with Volte in several cities. We, I was just looking at the results from uh, our Bristol trial at the moment, and the, the, the when you get it right, and it's not easy to get it right, when you get it right, the quality is, is, is tremendous. How's that going? What sort of coverage have you got? I know Bristol well. Um, yeah. What, what, how's it going? Very well. I mean, the, the results um, of mobility uh, on the 4G layer are pretty much 100% call success rate, which yeah. is which is tremendous. Yeah. Uh, we, we're, we're, I mean, we're, we're pretty happy with where we are on quality as a whole. And on voice quality, we've done a lot of effort on trying to improve over the last three years through integration and uh, and a lot of other things. So we're down to pretty much the best the best results in the UK at the moment. But 4G as a technology always has a better drop call rate uh, because of this, the the way the system is set up pretty much. Um, 3G generally is much better than 2G because it's got the soft handover yep. um, for voice. So we've you know, we made it very clear publicly that for Volti, we wouldn't actually launch it commercially on a big scale until we were happy that the quality was uh, as you know, getting close to 3G, better than the 2G. And that's where we're seeing now the results in Bristol showing that it can be even better than the 3G. And you know, reliability and quality is a huge focus for us. Sure. So we're feeling very positive about that, but we're not in a rush. So we'll take it uh, you know, at the pace that we need to to make sure that everything's right before we launch it on the whole country. 12.6 million 4G customers mm. on target for the end of the year, or figures that you hope to reach in due course. Have you, I don't want you to put you on the spot, man, so, but I mean, would you like it to be 15, 20 million in due course? I'm trying to think of what we announced as our target. I think it was 15 million by the end of the year. Mm. And if you look at those numbers, uh, I think we're pretty convinced that, that target's going to be smashed. And I don't see any reason why it shouldn't because I think it's pretty much accepted now that 4G is a massive uplift of customer experience. Mm. And for me, it's always been you know, the best radio technology ever invented so far. So, so I think, we'll, I think we're in a, on a good path to smash the 15 million target. I don't know how further we'll smash it, but so I think we'll get by the, the 15 million by the end of the year. Oh, there's only two, mo two months left, so yeah. Yeah, well, yeah this, is, this, is this is mid-October, but... <laughs> we'll get close. We'll get close. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Now, Let's talk about, you, we, you were talking about remote areas and the difficulties um, that come with that in getting mobile coverage of any sort, but you know, 4G, 3G, the rest of it, it becomes increasingly difficult. So as you're trying to reach your 95% coverage, the bits you've got left, the 2.5% you've got left, 
is getting progressively more difficult to do. Now, we are in here in Excel, in this enormous exhibition centre, and there are co-located other exhibitions as well as Broadband World Forum, including a tobacco show, which you don't see very often in the West anymore, which surprised me. Um, and also there's the Unmanned Aerial Vehicle exhibition. And I know you've been taking a look at that and you've been intrigued by what you've seen. Why is that important to EE? Yeah, it is very important to EE. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but about a year ago, our CEO, Olaf, um, who is a very determined character and a very demanding boss, a very good boss, he set us a challenge saying, look, you know, I'm sick of hearing that, you know, radio networks, mobile networks can't be available everywhere. And he said, find me a way you know, whatever it is, the Philosopher's Stone or <laughs> the Golden Elixir to get to 100% coverage everywhere in the UK, um, indoor and outdoor eventually, starting with the outdoor. So that's why with traditional means, we think that, you know, we're going to we're gonna get to close to 95% this year, next year very close to 98. The 800 megahertz will extend that coverage in the rural areas in particular. Mm. But to get to that last, you know, 1.5% or so is so difficult. Um, and today, economically, if you put up a 30-meter mast for villages sometimes of 10 or 15 houses, um, our CFO sometimes, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't even dare to <laughs> raise it. So, um, so pretty much, I was actually quite happy with that, that drive from Olaf because what he said was, look, you've got to innovate. You've got to do something new. And that's why he's kind of sanctioned me flying around the world and rummaging in dustbins and, and invest a bit like Indiana Jones looking for that you know, philosopher's stone. <laughs> so, so what have we found? We're pretty confident that we've got a range of solutions that would help us to, to get there within the next two to three years. So the first thing we'll be trialing out, I hope, in the next six months is um, well, what we call air mast technology. So we didn't want to be too specific when we announced that we'll be investigating air masts. But really, it's a combination of various methods. Can be balloon, balloons, can be UAVs. Uh, on the balloons front, we went to Asia and we spoke to some operators who use these for uh, disaster recovery, for radio coverage. So we're going to borrow one of those and uh, bring it to Scotland and try it out. <laughs> Where it will be blown away. <laughs> well, they say they can resist typhoon speed winds. Do they? Yeah. So let's test it out in, yeah. the, in, the, in the Shetlands and uh, in really remote areas in, uh, in Scotland. Yeah. So they found it, they've done a very interesting technology. I can't give it too much, but uh, they've got a way of stabilizing it. So that's one thing we'll be doing. In parallel, we're experimenting with satellite-based backhaul for 4G. Um, some operators have already rolled that out uh, as well in, in different countries, but not on 4G. So it could be one of the first on 4G. Thirdly, we are also going to be looking at UAVs, which is you know uh, remote-controlled aerial vehicles. Um, I can't give away too much today, but really to make that work, you need to make sure that you get a small cell solution which has, is very small, very compact to reduce the payload. Um, we need to solve the power issues, stability issues, and um, and then uh, we need a way to get the transmission to that small cell when it's being flown in the air. So you need to, you can either use a repeater or a meshed small cell. Now the meshed small cell is something that we've announced publicly. We're already rolling out in some villages. Um, um, we're in trial now in Sebrum. So that's with Parallel Wireless, our partner who do meshed small cells. So if you lift that in the air, it can mesh into your macro network at a certain height. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> the other thing is that we need to make sure we keep the costs down. So we are actively participating you know, with a lot of ac actors around the RAN space to go to open sourced, low cost solutions uh, very soon. So we're collaborating with, uh, with uh, a few entities and a few operators. And for example, I brought, I brought with me an example of the kind of thing we're doing in that space. So this is a, a very small, compact, software defined radio uh, development kit. It's multi-mode, so it can support uh, 4G, 3G, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, everything here. It's uh, open source. So the software on top of this, anybody can program. It is fully programmable uh, and it's fully tunable from 300 megs to 3.8 gig. Um, and it's USB pluggable into your laptop. So when you plug this into your laptop, um, then you can run it off your general processor in your laptop and it becomes a base station. And uh, what we hope to do with this is to get a bit of drive and, in and interest from the research community in the UK. And actually it's gonna be a lot of fun to get, uh, to give projects to universities and ask the researchers you know, build us a 4G base station, but do it like this, and now do it like that, building on top of this. So I think that's going to really accelerate the 5G ecosystem and accelerate research in the UK. So 
ideally through this we can get a range of solutions which would make it compact enough, tunable enough and low cost enough to solve the issue whether that's with the air mass or separately we should be able to solve how to get coverage economically into the remote areas such as the Scottish Islands. Absolutely fascinating. It's always good fun interviewing yeah. you because I learn m new stuff every time. And this is uh, by a British company that designs the, 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 the tunable chip in this. Uh, they're called Lime Microsystems and they're based in Guildford. So I'm really impressed to see... Guildford in Surrey. Guildford yeah. here in Surrey, yeah, yeah, quite, yeah. quite close by. Fascinating. Mansur Hanif, as usual, thanks very much. You're welcome.